Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Ross Duvall, the Chief Research Officer at the Milken Institute. So please come on in and take your seats for the last uh, session of the morning. Um, this session is titled U.S. Overview, Post-Election America and the World. So we have a number of things to cover. Uh, why don't we ask the panel to come on up, and I'll introduce them here in a moment. Please. Um, I think it's a vast understatement to say that the U.S. presidential election didn't quite go according to plan. Uh, Donald Trump captured several Midwestern cities. Please, please ascend. <laughs> please ascend. Thank you. Sorry. I'll introduce the panelists in just a moment. Um, we're going to try and touch on a number of policy issues after the election, uh, such as will a President Trump be different than a candidate Trump on policies? And there will be some speculation and I think some insight as well. Will a President Trump maybe take a more pragmatic approach to implementing policy? Um, but we have a great panel. The good news is for the Trump administration is that the U.S. economy appears to be strengthening it's, it's, uh, we hit a soft patch in the second half of 2015, early 2016, but in the third quarter, GDP growth was about 3.2%. Um, so as he enters the, the presidency, he's being left in a better position uh, than his predecessor was left at the end of the Bush administration. Um, so we're gonna talk about trade, globalization, uh, corporate tax reform, financial markets, um, had especially financial regulation and what might happen to such things as Dodd-Frank. So with that, let me get into the panel. To my right, we have Tony Frado, who is founder and partner of Hamilton Place Strategies and former deputy press secretary at the White House. Thank you for joining us, Tony. To my immediate right, your left, Adam Hitchcock, Managing Director at Guggenheim Partners. To my immediate left and your right, William Lee, Managing Director and Head of North American Economics at Citi, or I might refer to him as Bill. <laughs> uh, to my left, Richard Sakharides, who is Head of Public Affairs for G GLG. Let's dive right in and start with the heart of the matter. Um, what were the U.S. trends that the Clinton campaign might have missed perhaps, or at least underestimated, and why was the election outcome such a surprise to many? But Richard, maybe I could start with you and then we'll jump in here in a moment. Richard? Well, that certainly, first of all, thank you for having us. And that, you certainly start, you're certainly starting off with kind of the big question and everybody, ev the question that everybody in the States is trying to figure out. Um, Especially if you're a Democrat, and 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 we have we have we have two other uh, panelists here uh, who have uh, you know spent time at the White House, so I'm certainly interested to see to hear what they think also. Um, but uh, you know, I worked for um, I worked for President Bill Clinton uh, for most of the time he was president on the White House staff, and I got to know Hillary Clinton um, extremely well, and it's fair to say that you know, most of us thought that she was the perfect candidate uh, for president, perhaps in a different year, in a different political season. I think that she was running uh, against a strong headwind in what was essentially a change election. And, uh, you know, many people thought that uh, one of the Republicans that Donald Trump beat in the primary would have been uh, a likely successor to Barack Obama. Barack Obama, who was in the White House for eight years, it's very hard to have the one party in America retain the White House for uh, a 12-year period. So I think the, the, the important thing to remember, you know, when answering that question is, first of all, that she, that she was a great candidate, but she was running in a very difficult year, in a year where, the, where traditionally we would elect a Republican. The other thing, uh, of course, to remember is that um, uh, sh she had a very extremely clever opponent. Uh, who was, uh, who, who in a year in which uh, the electorate in the United States was very angry, and we see that trend globally, 
perhaps foreshadowed by Brexit, but in a year where there was a lot of anger, uh, Donald Trump really spoke to that anger and ran a very clever campaign. Um, so I think that probably, you know, no, there are probably lots of other things, and I'm sure other, the, some of the other panelists have it, but we'll, we'll speak to that. But I think uh, the, the, the most important things to remember are that she was running in a very difficult year, and in a year where there was a lot of anger and she was running on experience, it was really a changed election. The other thing, of course, to remember is that in our crazy system of electing a president, she, in fact, got two million more votes, so in some ways she won the popular vote, although not the presidency. Geography is destiny sometimes, though, <laughs> right? We have an electoral college system in the United States. Tony, um, weigh in here. Yeah, on this, on this, on this question, I, I, look, I, th I think we actually, in um, retrospect, I hear it a lot in, 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 uh, in London, too, in trying to you know, figure out what, what happened with Brexit, right? And, and, um, and uh, and I think there's a lot of time and energy spent on trying to figure that out when I think really if you just step back and say that, you know, definitely in the case of the United States and probably in the case of, uh, of the UK also, it's a divided country. And you, you can, you can, you can uh, go crazy trying to read too much into what, what accounted for very small differences. And we cannot forget at the end of the day that you know, a half of a percent <laughs> change in a vote, and we're not having this conversation at all. In fact, right. I was doing a, uh, a panel with a close colleague of mine uh, who, uh, who's, a, who's a Democrat just days after the election, and, uh, and she was, you know, really, really pretty upset and, and broken up talking about the future of the Democratic Party and what this means and how the party is split and it's got a lot to account for and how are we all gonna get together and try to rebuild what the Democratic Party is and what it means. <laughs> And I said, you know, look, if a, half, a change of half of a percent of a vote, and I'm giving your talk, right? I'm the one talking about a very divided, broken Republican Party, and what are we going to do to rebuild? In fact, I'll tell you, there were a number of us who had plans after the election to get together and meet and talk about how we're going to rebuild the Republican Party. And now, no one's, you know, that meeting was canceled, needless to say. <laughs> <laughs> so, Adam, any other observations? Yeah, look, I'd agree with everything that the two other panelists have said, but the one thing Tony and I were talking about the other day that has gotten, I think, almost no attention is, while on the surface this election looked very unconventional, we can talk about all the different theatrics that occurred, if you look at the fundamental dynamics of the election, it's remarkably conventional, mm -hmm. right? The coalitions of the two parties do not overlap at all. And the way to think about it is they're sort of broken along the lines of race, education, age, and geography. Right, the Democrats are multi-ethnic, better educated, younger, and tend to live in urban areas. And the Republicans are uh, the reverse of that. And those coalitions have been remarkably durable. I worked on the 08 campaign for President Obama, and then I worked in the White House in the Chief of Staff's office. That was the exact same case eight years ago as it was today. In fact, it was the exact same case going even further back. So it's this broader political realignment that's happening in our country that's been playing out for decades. So in many ways, this is just a continuation of that trend. Maybe it was accelerated, but for the most part, it was just a continuation of that. And then the one difference in of this between 12 or 08 was that Trump was able to juice his turnout just a little bit amongst a group that's a declining share of the overall electorate, while Hillary had a group that is an increasing share of the electorate, but she wasn't able to turn them out at the levels that Barack Obama did. And the last thing I'd add is, is that within that framework, what Donald Trump did was he won the only way he could possibly win. And I talked about it with my colleagues at the White House you know, several months ago that there was only one path. Everyone knew what that one path was. And it was for Trump to go and win the upper Midwest by appealing to older, non-college educated white men living in rural areas. And I grew up in a small town in Indiana and so I could see that trend. Like people in, <laughs> in the global cities, I live in Chicago, uh, which is still the Midwest, but it's very different than where I grew up. Spent a lot of time in New York and LA and London and DC. And you talk to folks in these cities and they speak of like a Trump voter as if though they're gonna go out into the wild and see <laughs> one. <laughs> and they're like, I don't know anyone that votes for Trump. And they're like, Who do, you, do you know anyone? I was like, yeah, I grew up with them. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think that what Trump was able to do was to juice that, uh, that turnout in those three states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. And that's the story. And I think Tony's right. 
to overanalyze this is just crazy. And I think I worry that the Democratic Party is going to say, oh, we have to just start from scratch versus a half point difference. They say, oh, we're going to have the presidency in perpetuity. It'll be like a monarchy. Right. Exactly. Now, it's interesting. I, back in January, I spoke at a municipal bond conference after Laura Ingram, who told the audience there were unbelievable similarities between many Bernie Sanders supporters and Donald Trump supporters. So obviously in the general election that became a very small amount, but a lot of those people, I grew up in Ohio, right? right? My wife went to IU, so I know the Midwest oh, wow. pretty well. So was she, all right? Uh, so I'm going there in a couple of weeks anyhow. <laughs> uh, but some of those voters, those white kind of s rural disaffected voters did vote for Donald Trump and it made a big difference in Wisconsin, Michigan, right in Ohio. Bill, let me turn to you. Do you want to weigh in on some of the politics of it, or do you want to focus on the economics first? Let me, let me start with, uh, carry some yeah. of Adam's remarks uh, and, and frame it perhaps in the world that I know. Uh, I spent my entire professional life uh, at the Fed studying financial markets, at the IMF worrying about financial markets as the editor of the Global Financial Stability Report, and now working in financial markets with my colleagues at Citi. And if we could pull up slide number two, um, let me frame it in the metaphor of financial markets. Financial markets call rare events and surprising events black swans. And what we have is the season of the black swan. And, and in this world of the black swan, what, what we see are trends that have, have percolated up. The discontent that, that the panel has talked about. Slide two, please. The discontent that has come from uh, globalization and the cost of globalization, which we'll talk about in a moment. And, and, and there's this discontent that, that pushes people toward being more isolationist, more protectionist. And right under the surface of, that, of, that, of, of what has bubbled up is social unrest. Um, a greater sense that, you know, the, the system just isn't working, and that's what has been expressed in the politics. Now, what about the economics of the United States? Um, in terms of the, of the economy, as, as Ross said, the U.S. is doing quite well. It's actually um, doing better than we thought with the surprising uh, upturn in third quarter GDP. Yeah. But beyond economics, beyond the GDP numbers, what we have are people with a bimodal distribution of income. There are those who have succeeded very well in this globalized economy, and there are those who have been left behind. And the theorems of international trade taught you everybody gains by opening up the trade. But where does, where does the rest of the theorem say? If you tax those who gain and subsidize and bring back those who lost to where they were originally, you're still left over with stuff that you can redistribute. In other words, you've enlarged the pie, but you have to remember to recarve the pie in a way that subsidizes and restores people back to where they were before. Now, that's what's not been done by any country in any uh, economy, in any politics, and that has gone on for decades. And so as the globalists have talked about the benefits of globalization, we have ignored the costs of globalization. And I think that's the, the, the trend that we have seen in the in US economy and also in the global economy. So it's not just a, the season of the black swan is not a US event, it's a global event because all countries, all economies have been exposed to globalization and they've been exposed to these costs. And we'll go into that more in detail later. Bill, let me direct the next question to you first. Financial markets have reacted fairly favorably yeah. since the election in the U.S. Why and is it rational that they have reacted in this manner? That's a, that's a great question. I, in fact, um, I've been marketing the um, last couple of weeks, um, especially in, in, in light of the, the election, and what surprised all of us is that all of our predictions were wrong, right? We, before the election, we went around telling everybody, you know, if Trump gets in, watch out, because we're going to have currency wars, we're going to have uh, tariff protection, we're going to have disruptions to the labor market, that's because of all the immigrants that are going to be thrown out. Uh, and, and so be prepared for a disaster. Now that disaster took about three minutes in the financial markets and yeah. then um, reversed themselves, right? And what, what is it that markets are seeing? Well, they're seeing, um, if we can have um, slide nine, we're seeing proposals that are now bringing fiscal policy into action. Right, which for the first time in U.S. Uh, in, in several decades, we now have fiscal policy being galvanized and, 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 and being able to supplement what monetary policy has been shouldering for years. And monetary mm -hmm. policy has been losing its effectiveness. Now there's some hope that fiscal policy comes on board. What the markets have done is because everyone in the markets is smarter than everybody else, they say, aha, fiscal spending, 
right? Infrastructure spending. That's a new ferry does. It's supposed to make everything better. That uh, was a Hillary Clinton proposal. Um, it was, yeah. And, and <laughs> which doesn't make it right. <laughs> um, and there's tax reform, both in lowering tax rates and expanding bases. That's the Republican agenda for Ryan for decades. Yeah. And so what the markets are seeing is tax relief, fiscal spending, we've got to have a stronger economy. Now, by markets reacting the way they have, in other words, stronger dollar, higher rates, what does that do? Econ 101, mm -hmm. higher rates, higher exchange rates, depresses GDP. So what it really entails then would be a, a lowering of GDP growth. If we could have um, slide number 12. Um, these proposals essentially increase stimulus, but what, what the markets have done is that the it questions the timing, because as you know, the legislature right, takes some time to pass tax reform. It takes time to put in place whatever spending is going to take place. Now, before that, as the markets have already reacted, what I've done in our city forecast has been to lower 2017 growth by about a quarter point. And yes, we'll see the fiscal stimulus come in, but not until 2018. And now, when you ask yourself, what, are, what is the stock market smoking, right? <laughs> what is it seeing? Is it seeing the immediate- It's legal in more states now, by <laughs> the way. <laughs> uh, absolutely. They can smoke it. Is, this, is, it <laughs> is it the slowdown they see, or is it the, the, the increase later on? And I think the one thing they do see, and, and, and sorry, I'll get back to you in a moment. The one thing they do see accurately is regulatory relief. That they see is something that will increase their cash flow. The second thing they see is any kind of corporate tax reform that will also increase cash flow. But what are they going to do with it? What are they going to do with that extra money? Well, so far, every bit of dollars they get on their balance sheet, 60 cents on every dollar is given back in dividends and stock buyback. So are we going to see more investment? Unlikely. Are we going to see more dividends? Absolutely. And I think that's the thing that the stock market actually sees is shareholder friendly stuff. But in terms of what happens to GDP, will it increase efficiency? Unlikely. Adam, so does, does Guggenheim have an opinion on how the markets have reacted so thus far? I mean, I, I, I'd be hesitant to speak for Guggenheim or the entire firm. Your own opinion. Right. <laughs> Though we'll put that disclaimer out <laughs> right. there. Right. Uh, this could end up being my last panel ever. <laughs> um, I think what I can't get over when people talk about growth, and you see all these numbers thrown about US GDP getting back to 4%, 5%. Um, that Trump supporters will say, and they'll ask why, and they'll say, well, we're going to give tax cuts and regulatory relief. But in reality, growth is driven by workforce and productivity. And workforce is just a demographic issue. And if, because of the aging of our workforce, the way to make our workforce younger to get more people of working age is to increase immigration, well, that's not going to happen. And then productivity, productivity is driven by investment, whether it be infrastructure investment, or corporate investment, that plays out over a longer period of time. And if you go and you look, like what Bill just said, 60% of uh, profits by corporates go back to the shareholders right. in the form of a dividend or a buyback. Right. And there's been no infrastructure investment in the US or not at the level it should be for decades. So even if you were to start seeing those investments occur, which I'm deeply skeptical that they would, you wouldn't see the increased growth because of the increased productivity for several years. So I, I don't quite understand where people just throw out numbers of 3%, 4%, 5%. And having worked in the White House, economic policy, what the president controls in cooperation with Congress, it takes many, many years for it to really work its way uh, through the system. So I'm, I'm skeptical uh, of the okay, numbers. Okay, some skepticism. Out. Let's get into some of the policy issues, and we'll get the panel's opinions on that. Uh, the Trump transition team, including Treasury Secretary nominee Steven Mnuchin, have indicated that corporate tax reform, broader business tax reform, is going to be a top priority. What are the prospects, and could financial markets be pricing in significant change in corporate tax policy? Anyone? Well, I mean, I, I, I think that to, to that question and to the points that have just been made, that, uh, you know, it's good that the markets are having a positive reaction. Uh, but I think that, uh, I think it is mostly an emotional reaction. It's, emotional, it's an emotional rea reaction uh, by business who thinks, well, you know, we, ha we have a president who says that he supported lower corporate tax rates and, and infrastructure spending, and those are traditionally uh, policies where uh, business does well, yeah. but but I think that it, this will prove itself very illusory, and I, I mean I hope it lasts for a long time. But I, I I'm skeptical that um, once once uh, President Trump takes office, once we start to have some congressional hearings around some of these nominees, um, 
w you know, w once we're in the first 100 or 200 days of a Trump presidency, I think that a lot of these policies will run into the kind of gridlock that uh, most uh, kind of uh, broad-based change in Washington has seen so far. Now, I'm hope I, I hope I'm wrong because Democrats have long favored um, you know, corporate tax re uh, uh, tax relief too. I mean, we ought to simplify yeah. the tax reform. We ought to, ought to simplify the tax code in the U.S. We ought to uh, spend on infrastructure. Um, but I think some of the, I think some of what Mr. Trump has articulated is going to be very hard to enact. Number one and number two is um, I think people are fooling themselves if they if they say they know what he's for because he ran a campaign that was unique in, its, in, in the fact that it was almost completely devoid of any real policy formulation that you could count on. He proved himself as a candidate to be someone who would change his mind at an instant and without warning, that there was nothing really he stood for other than the fact that he wanted to be popular. And I think as a president, unfortunately, that's the kind of thing we're going to see from him. We're going to see a, a U.S. president who is mostly interested in staying popular. And if there is a policy which he thinks will lead to his, po his increased popularity, increased ratings in the polls, uh, uh, an increased likelihood that he might be reelected, re he will follow that policy. And he is not really someone who is uh, invested in helping business succeed. He's really only interested in helping himself succeed. Can I yeah. Is, is Trump going to need help maybe from a Paul Ryan perhaps to make this happen? Well, yeah, ob obviously it's going to take both, uh, both Congress and, and uh, the executive branch to get, to get any of these things done. But if you yeah. think about, I, I take Adam's point, I put my, I put my um, you know, economist hat on and say, well, yeah, definitely if we're talking about um, you know, potential growth, we look, at, we look at growth in the adult civilian labor force and productivity, add them up and you get, and you get, uh, and you get that. But don't want to discount the you know old-fashioned Keynesian mm -hmm. <laughs> boost to growth by things mm -hmm. like uh, um, uh, you know whether it's increased infrastructure spending or or, or uh, it, it, we're still going to have a very accommodative uh, monetary policy environment and uh, and maybe some movement on tax reform also so there, there are reasons where at least over the short term you can make a case for uh, elevated levels of growth mm -hmm. why, why the relief for um, you know, for Trump, I think is some of the some of it was mentioned already. I think if you were if you were looking at what the world was going to look like in a Clinton um, in the Clinton administration and a Republican uh, Congress, whether it, was, whether it was just the House or both houses of, of Congress, was uh, at best gridlock. And if you were a, a business, a lot of my clients, you know, look thinking about being on the very defensive on uh, financial regulatory policy, yeah. on tax policy. <laughs> Uh, not a great hope for for doing more on uh, on trade, uh, so they were they were very defensive at a very defensive mindset, and I thought that that, I think that permeated throughout the community. So when when Trump wins and you see a unified uh, government, where we will see a unified government for the first time, whatever your views on it, there's going to be lots of movement on legislation. Whatever happens with tax reform or tax cuts, we know it's not going to be. We're not, we know that. that a Republican Congress and a Republican president aren't talking about tax increases. Whatever happens with regulation, we're not talking about you know heavy-handed increases in regulation. We're not seeing an energized Elizabeth Warren, uh, who was you know really sharpening her her claws and fangs to you know to be you know super energized in a with the Clinton administration and and even being a filter on who was going to be in key posts in government. Now, in a in a in a Trump administration, I, I think. Uh, there is a lot of question as to what exactly the direction is going to be. And we wouldn't have said this before in whether it was the Bush administration. If you look at the Bush administration going into 2001 and you see Larry Lindsey and Glenn Hubbard and a fairly detailed policy um, uh, record laid out in the campaign, you had a good idea of what a Bush administration was going to do on economic policy. If you look at the Obama administration and you see Larry Summers and Tim Geithner and Gene Sperling and a fairly you know, elaborate policy <laughs> record laid out during the campaign. You had a good idea of how they were going to govern. You don't really have that here. So what you do is you look for two things, I think. One is, where is Congress? And Congress has done actually a lot of work on these issues already. They have views, and they're going to try to um, uh, uh, execute them on, on trade and tax policy, though maybe with some conflict on some of that that we can get into. Um, 
And then you look at a, what I think is going to be, especially outside of the White House and all the departments and agencies, is a highly personality, um, uh, you know, policy environment. It's going to be highly dependent on who sits in certain positions. So, in a Bush administration or an Obama administration, you put someone in as the the, uh, the chair of the SEC, and I could predict you know, what, what they're, what they're going to be. I don't care who the person is. I know what that person is generally going to be like in either of those administrations. Here, I can't tell you what the SEC is going to be like, what their posture is going to be on a whole range of issues until you tell me who the chairman of the SEC is going to be. And so that's why I say it's a, you know, policy, it's a personality uh, environment. We need to know who the, who the key can people I are going to be. Can I jump in here? Oh, go ahead. One mm -hmm. thing I want to emphasize is that, uh, if we could pull up number eight, uh, slide number eight. One thing about what Tony just said is heightened uncertainty. Now, what's the one thing that's guaranteed with heightened uncertainty? People tend to do less and do it later, right? So with heightened uncertainty, essentially all economic decisions are being delayed. And in this world where we don't have really rarely had mandated governments, mandated governments being one party with the president <coughs> and Congress, the upper right-hand side chart there shows that post-World War II history, those are very rare occurrences. But, and during the times when we don't have a mandate government, we have a lot of presidential vetoes and Congress potentially overriding these vetoes. Right now, with a mandate government, as Tony said, we have the clearest hope that there is a galvanized fiscal policy that would be able to do something. Government? Why do you say that? Well, because, well, the fact that Trump has a dr dropped his own tax proposal and adopted the Ryan proposal shows that he is willing to, to, to work with the Congress to try to get through tax reform. Tax reform is different than tax stimulus. No one in Congress has ever talked about stimulus per se, but rather they want to reform the tax system to be able to lower the mar marginal tax rates and affect the corporate tax well rates. Well, listen, I mean, I think mm -hmm. that, that the Trump administration will try to tell the American people that they have some kind of a mandate. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that, that, that there may be an illusion of a mandate because the Republicans control uh, both the Congress and the executive branch in the U.S. now, but um, I, I, you know, I think that that w this will prove very illusory, and I, I'm interested to see what you know. Tony referenced uh, uh, the, the 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 United Government. I mean, it's interesting. Will be certainly interesting to see if Congress is willing to fall in line behind a President Trump. I, mean, I, I think that we're really right. we're really <laughs> in a honeymoon. I mean, I, I and I don't want to be overly critical of President-elect Trump. I mean, I you know. Uh, I'm, I'm on the other, I'm on the other, I want to take some of that back. I mean, I'm, I'm on the other side politically, but we hope he's successful. But, um, I, you know, I think that they, um, I think that he, he you know, he's appointed uh, some very right-wing ideological people so far. I think that they will have a tough time getting through Congress. And I, I think the honeymoon will be short-lived and, and uh, it's going to be very interesting to see if the force of his personality can carry him uh, uh, as a governing president the way it did it as a candidate. And that's to our point of heightened uncertainty. I think with heightened uncertainty, people will delay decisions. But if you're going to have to push, uh, toss a coin and say, I've got to make a decision today, the one decision you're going to try to count on is, for at least at beginning with the current configuration of the government and what Trump has adopted from the standard Republican platform, it seems like there is that initial unity, so and everyone's going to try to make use of that momentum as I quickly as possible. Say, yeah. I'm just, just, if there's one thing we can say about whether it was a, a Trump candidacy and what will be a Trump presidency, is that it's idiosyncratic, yeah. right? I would yeah. not look okay. back at history and say it was like this, so therefore it's going to be like that. I would say he has, he has maximum flexibility to do whatever he wants on policy, on people, on how he conduct, we we're seeing this, right? On how yeah. he conducts himself in uh, uh, lots of different in lots of different ways. Meeting with Mitt Romney, of course he could do like right. I mean, maximum flexibility. He does. He is not. He does not see himself as someone who is um, responsible for the future of the Republican Party. His past presidents have seen themselves as the leader of the party, not just as uh, president. Have felt some obligation to. Um, to uh, back up, in fact, if you, if you look at b look at back both at the Bush administration and the Obama administration, um, <coughs> where uh, you know while their parties had control of Congress, did not veto legislation at all, right? No vetoes of legislation while their party was in control of Congress. They saw it as you know uh, problematic to be fighting with their party and to try to support their party. 
it's not for, it's to look for for Donald Trump. And I would say I would I would clear your head of any uh, of what you know anything that will color your view of the field in front of you, and how you see him act, and make your judgments based on that, and not not think about. As they say in financial markets, history is not a predictor exactly. of future performance. It's not right. That's a disclaimer. City would never do that, though. <laughs> um, how how might Trump's election affect financial market reform? We touched on this a little bit, but. Maybe Dodd Frank are there elements that might be open to renegotiation? Yeah, well, there? actually, the, the, I think the the thing on this. I'm sorry, I'm going to jump in on that, Ross. But like, ahead. but I do think it's really important for people to understand that um, Dodd Frank. We, it'll be hard to re overturn Dodd Frank, right? Because right. the one you can't do it in recon reconciliation. You're going to need uh, 60 votes in the Senate to do it. But remember that Dodd Frank has uh, enormous flexibility for yeah. the regulators, enormous flexibility, and so there's a lot that they can do without having to move legislation. What about small banks, community banks? Uh, I mean, th uh, that's one of the biggest complaints I hear when I talk to them, you know, the capital con requirements. That's uh, exactly right, and, and that's, that's exactly where we expect the regulatory relief to occur immediately. Um, the getting small businesses access to credit is something that has been on both parties' agenda, and that's an easy win. Uh, and, and in fact, I, you know, coming from city, I know that what we've done post-crisis has been to adapt ourselves to the Dodd-Frank world. So quite frankly, I think city and some of the larger banks are quite comfortable with the higher regulatory requirements and higher capital requirements. And we're already there, right? We're already doing CCAR. But the small banks have this enormous burden of having to acquire compliance officers, acquire more lawyers, just to be able to respond to these uh, increased regulations. So the big debate in Congress right now over Dodd-Frank is going to be, what number does it cut in? Is it $10 billion in assets, $50 billion, or $250 billion? And the more likely outcome is going to be to try to allow the smaller banks to have that regulatory relief so that credit could be supplied more to the smaller businesses. So does everyone agree with Tony that Really, it's what are the key appointments to financial regulatory institutions such as the SEC? We don't have to change the law per se, but it's how we interpret those those well regulations. It's not just that, right? It's, yeah. it's how are these people that are put in the heads of these agencies going to interpret? How are they going to go about whatever rulemaking is left or whatever new rulemaking happens? Uh, and then the other thing, and you and I talked about it the other day, is enforcement, right? Things you can't get done through rulemaking, you can do de facto by enforcement. So if you go out and you enforce it a certain right. way, everybody else that sees that enforcement, they're not gonna be like, well, that's not technically a rule, so I guess we don't really have to do it that way, or the rule's not mm -hmm. clear. The enforcement makes it very clear. So you, in effect, get rulemaking by enforcement. And a lot of times that's done at the staff level, but you know the people who are chosen at the top will have a big influence on that. But Tony, right. I think the, the other thing that I think you were saying, <coughs> which I think was a, was a particularly insightful point, is that um, uh, unlike what we're used to in American politics, where the executive, uh, the president, uh, dictates you know ev every little minute piece of policy, um, that Donald Trump and and the people immediately around him have shown themselves to be less concerned with the minutia of policy and more concerned with big uh, with big trends and kind of um, the the appearance of things and and whether things appear right for the little guy and so forth, so that uh, for the first time in a long time, certainly th for the first time in a long time in my memory, that um, people in, the, in Washington who are given responsibility to run some of these agencies actually will be able to exert quite a bit of personal influence around what they do. So when you, for instance, when you, when you have a Jeff Sessions, who is the senator from Alabama, yeah who has been uh, nominated to be in charge of the U.S. Justice Department uh, because of his own personal, very conservative, very right-leaning views, it may be the case that he actually influences policy for a large number of Americans on issues of, of uh, civil rights, on issues of uh, criminal justice, on issues of immigration. And, and you know, Trump, w Trump is, uh, President-elect Trump is, is, is mostly someone who will give broad um, policy outlines, but we'll let people, other people, worry about the details. That's the that's a, the point you're making, right? Yeah. Right. L let's let's move on to trade. A couple of other areas we're going to touch on. Candidate Trump uh, ran in a platform opposed to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. He also stated he wanted significant changes to NAFTA. Maybe even a bit bit more verbose than that. <laughs> more than significant <laughs> changes. Maybe throwing it away. Will a President Trump be a bit more? pragmatic than a candidate Trump as it relates to 
trade? What, what's the strategy? Can I jump in on yeah. the, uh, because, um, again, let me bring you back to Econ 101. In the theorem of international trade, free trade was supposed to make everybody better off. But we're not talking about free trade. We're talking about TPP, a customs union. That's mm -hmm. called distorted trade, right? So we're moving from one form of distorted trade to a slightly different form of distorted trade. And what is, what is it that Trump is proposing? Well, it's that all that campaign talk, I think, has gone away post-election because the f clear agenda that, that seems to be there is bring them to the negotiating table. Again, Econ 101. Who is it that gains from trade when you're open to trade? Small country, big country. It's small country. Why? Because the terms of trade change most for that small country. So, so in this TPP customs union world, when you negotiate the terms, the gains are much more diffuse. But the objective of the uh, mandate that Trump has is maximize income for U.S. residents. In order to do that, you engage in bilateral negotiation. So you go from distorted trade to distorted trade, but the objective of the new distortion is maximize domestic income. Now, that could do terrible things to global economy, but that's not his mandate, right? His mandate is maximize U.S. income and in U.S. employment. So I think in, in this kind of world, the objective of everything he said about trade is to bring them to the negotiating table, even to the point of saying, let's use the mushroom cloud, currency manipulator, right? In the trade world, the minute you, you articulate those words, that's tantamount to blowing up the, 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 the mushroom cloud. So I think by, by putting the, your, 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 I think one of the things I've learned about the Trump from his colleagues in the New York real estate market is, whatever you say, remember, it's always the beginning of a negotiating position. Right? Whatever you say, it's always the beginning of the negotiating position. So what you want to say is give yourself as much advantage at the negotiating table as possible. So when you say that Trump has no principles, yeah, the principle is maximize domestic income. If you keep that objective in mind, you can reconcile a lot of what he's been talking about. And again, the, the, the objective of trade now is to switch from customs union distortion to bilateral trade arrangement distortion in order to maximize domestic income. But what I, yeah. you know, what Please I, what I actually worry about is I think when we talk about trade, it feels very narrow to me. I feel like th the better way to think about it is to sort of elevate it and look at what are the common themes here that we see. And Trump said it is close as virus says, they keep referencing economic nationalism. And to me, that's what I find worrying. If you look at the, the policies that are coming out that Paul Ryan has put forward, they're relatively conventional, right? If mm -hmm. Jeb Bush had won or mm -hmm. John Kasich had won, we would have seen those typical policies. I, I worry because if you think about who was it that gave Donald Trump the presidency, it's you know the folks in the Midwest that I, that I referenced, and they are not fans of free trade. And when I worked at the White House, when 2010 happened and the Tea Party happened, those were people who did not, uh, I guess you would say, have an internationalist worldview. And what I worry about is that trade is just one component of this, right? So Trump can outsource the domestic economic policy to Paul Ryan, but the president has an incredible amount of influence when it comes to international economics, and you don't need Congress to do those. And what I worry about is this resurgent economic nationalism that isn't just limited to the United States. We see it in a lot of the uh, developed economies. And I worry that it you're already seeing the manifestations of this with Trump, which is TPP is dead, whether or not you think that's good policy or not, mm -hmm. it's effectively dead. China sees that as an opportunity. You've seen it last week where Trump was beating up on Carrier, a company that's based in, uh, uh, that has, well, they're part of a conglomerate, but they had a factory in Indiana. They're going to move some of the jobs to Mexico. So Trump beat up on them. Incredibly popular polling, right? The initial oh yeah. polls say it was, had 60% approval rating, 20% disapproval. And I'm surprised that the 60% wasn't higher. And Trump's yeah. going to see that as, Oh, I can do that without Congress. So Vindication, Paul Ryan, yeah. right? Paul Ryan, and those guys can handle the economic policy. I'll fly around. I'll beat up on these corporations. I'll hold a rally afterwards, and then I think you could see, <laughs> right? So what becomes a convenient target? Trade becomes a convenient target. Multinational corporations become a convenient target. Multilateral institutions become a convenient target. And we already saw this when I was at the White House, which was it took us five years to get IMF reform through Congress, through Republican Congress, and Trump understood more than the rest of the Republican Party candidates, that the base of the party, the energy and the numbers, are with the nationalists. And I worry that he's going to keep playing to that. And there's a lot he can do yeah. that doesn't require Congress. Right. Adam, one other thing, though. 
it, Trump is not the only president, and we're not the only country to play industrial policy, right? What yeah. was all these subsidies for solar panels doing oh. uh, a few years yeah. ago, right? That, again, a subsidy and trying to play industrial policy, trying to pick winners. What did the Singaporeans do when they tried to rebuild the semiconductor industry there to compete with the Taiwanese? Again, industrial policy. And, and as an economist, I have to say, industrial policy is a, is a gamble that is more missed than hit. And so I, I certainly don't, don't condone any of that kind of action. But it's not just a Trump action. Well, I agree with that. But see, you're going to see a lot of this, right? I mean, yeah. we're, I mean this, is, this, is, this, this is this is coming, among the Democrats. and, and this, this in some ways gets to kind of like the heart of the matter uh, in the in the panel description, and, and that is to what extent these trends that we see in the U.S. are reflective of the trends throughout Western Europe, or yeah. reflective of many of the trends that that we've seen here, or and that we're seeing in Italy, or that we're seeing in France, or you know, just recently. Well, I mean, the common yeah. theme, right, is, is that these leaders, and you can debate whether it's right or wrong, but these leaders in these instances are making a decision where they're saying, I am choosing the immediate interest of my country over support for the overall global system. We can decide whether that's good or bad or whatever it is, but what I think is problematic is that you see so many countries doing this simultaneously, and it seems to be ascending. It's less of a problem today, I agree, if not... Uh, catastrophic, but I worry that the trajectory is very negative, and not to be overly dramatic, but you know, we saw what happened with this in the 1930s, which is why we put in place a certain uh, global economic framework after the uh, after World War II. And again, I don't want to be that extreme, but I worry about the trend line. Uh, can we discuss NAFTA just for a moment? I mean, he candidate Trump campaigned on this theme heavily. Um, we talked about the Midwest reaction, what put him over the top. Are the legitimate issues as it relates to NAFTA and reopening it, so, such as energy policy, that wasn't addressed originally. I mean, yeah, does it make sense to, to look at that? That's been something I've been, I've been trying to recommend to people also. Look, I, there's no bigger um, supporter uh, of NAFTA than, than I am. I'm like a, you know, a long time, uh, uh, worked on it you know, years ago in the 90s, and uh, I, I, you know, every time someone says, in fact, every time it's you know, Trump or, or Clinton, or, pre or pre you know, President Obama back in 2008, yes. right, I, I said, if Trump didn't come up with the idea of pulling out of NAFTA. It's actually both Obama and Clinton in 2008 uh, yeah. talked about pulling out of yeah. NAFTA also. And I would always rise to the defense of, of NAFTA and, and still do. That said, um, NAFTA was negotiated at a time when, when Mexico was um, a very different country than it is today, <coughs> when the nature of that trade is very different than it is today. Uh, Canada is in a much different place than it was today. Neither of them are really uh, in the same way uh, supplicants uh, like they were back then. And I think it would be a very different negotiation today. The, 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 the Trump administration, a lot of the people around the Trump, in Trump campaign said uh, after the election that you know, they, were, they, were, they were surprised at how many people took them you know, literally on, on what he said. He shouldn't have you know, should not have taken them so literally on what he said. Uh, so I would just use that a little bit as a guide and say, well, okay, so we're not, maybe not pull out of NAFTA, but a renegotiation of NAFTA. And if it is a renegotiation of NAFTA, that might be a good thing. I mean, it's, I'd rather keep NAFTA the way it is, but, but it could be a good thing. And okay. you talk about things like, um, like an energy chapter. Uh, right. We have not had it, we, you know, there was not an energy chapter. We could not have concluded an agreement with Mexico in 1992 with an energy chapter. They wouldn't have, uh, that's not something they would have signed. Mm -hmm. It may be something, um, we know it would be beneficial to Mexico to have an energy chapter today. Yeah. And I think uh, maybe the Canadians and Americans would feel the same way. So there, are, there, there may be opportunities here in rethinking uh, agreements. Whether you do them bilaterally, Bill and I have different views on whether, you know, on yeah. TPP, um, you know, I'm a, a, a proponent and, and working on TPP as well. Would love to see TTIP, and and um, and I'm, uh, we were we were criticized in the Bush administration for focusing too much on bilateral trade agreements, uh, and not enough on multilateral trade agreements. And uh, Obama administration felt if you're going to spend all that time and energy on a bilateral agreement, you could have a much bigger bang by doing a multilateral agreement. Which is how well it worked out. Which is an, it's a <laughs> <laughs> it's done. Yeah. yeah. So we, we did 11 trade agreements right. that we negotiated, yep. and. Um, you know, some were really small and some were big, but we felt we felt that it was important to keep the the, the, the pressure on on trade. Just one last point on this, though, on just an overall for all of us, not just in the United States, but everywhere. Bill talked about this being a global issue. <coughs> We've done a piss poor job of explaining trade. Yeah. We're we're yeah. not good at it. We we have not we've never been good at it. Yeah. Uh, we talk about it in very asymmetric ways. We talk about 
you know, um, that we talk about when we're, when we're talking to our citizens about it, you know, uh, we're, we're not really talking about, you know, sort of Ricardian trade <laughs> principles, right? We talk right. only about one side of it. You know, exports are good with the implication that imports are bad, right? We don't talk about the, uh, the disruption of trade. In my party, Republicans, um, we love talking about uh, the benefits of trade and free markets. We, you know, we, we don't talk about what happens to people if right. there's dislocation. And we have to stop that. We have to think about what are the consequences. As Bill said, you know, investing in what happens to people. I, I know exactly what to do with a factory um, that, is, uh, that has been competed out of usefulness, right? I can, um, I can you know, write off the value of it, I can sell it, I can turn it into a mall, I can do all kinds of things with the bricks and mortar of a factory. If I've got someone who is um, you know, 38 years old and they've worked in a factory for 20 years of their life, I've got them for the next 40 years of their life. I need to do something with them. I need to figure out what do I do with this asset to make it productive in this economy. And it's not selling them false hope that you know, steel jobs are going to come back. That's not the answer for them. We need to figure out a different answer for Any them. Any last thoughts on trade? Then we'll yeah, move on I real quick. Say one, one more thing to add to what Tony said, which is that just as economies change over time, trade agreements have to change over time. And right. we have no mechanism in place to change trade agreements because they're so hard to put together in the multilateral fashion. I mean, there's a saying about you know, trade, trade treaties are always started by liberals, right? But they're always closed by protectionists. And I think one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that once you have a, a trade treaty in place, touching it becomes a third rail. And you don't want to touch it because you know you're not it's going to unravel on you. That's why bilateral trade agreements are easier to renegotiate because they are bilateral. And yes, you give up some general principles. You give up things that could apply to many countries. But boy, the flexibility that entails, that's entailed with those bilateral policies, I think, trumps a lot of other alternatives. I just want to touch on monetary policy real quick, and this is a, an area of interest of mine, so uh, humor me on this. Candidate Trump campaigned that the Federal Reserve should have been raising interest rates long ago. So I, I've been Did forecasting you know this. Yeah, so <laughs> let's, yeah. So what happens in a couple weeks, perhaps, when the Fed decides to raise interest rates and a president-elect Trump potentially criticizes the Fed for raising interest rates. You guys should have done it before. Now I'm president. No, that's a wrong thing to do. I mean, what's that mean for inside the Fed and its um, independence, perhaps? I th maybe as someone who was actually inside the Fed at the forecast table talking about these consequences. I thought you might have an opinion uh, on this. <laughs> let, me, let me start the ball rolling. Um, I think for, for Trump, honestly, he couldn't care less if he got a tight policy Fed or an easy policy Fed. Why? Because, quite frankly, as president, he won't see the consequences of higher interest rates hitting higher interest expenses on the U.S. debt for years to come. So he's got a lot of leeway in between now, between now and then to what he's to worry about. What he does view the Fed as is a bargaining chip. I will give you Republicans a Fed that is more responsive to a rule, that is more accountable, that is more auditable, if you give me more on the tax side, more on the trade side, and that I think is where the bargaining is going to be. Yes, the Republicans for decades have been wanting more accountable Fed, take away more of the discretionary powers, put a Taylor rule in place, but let the Taylor rule be, you know, you allow the Fed to have exceptions because there are circumstances. And you come to Congress and explain why I didn't follow the rule. Even John Taylor himself, who I have to cards on the table as my thesis advisor back in Columbia. At least you put that disclaimer out there. I, 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 John himself would say, you know, the rule is just a guideline. And yeah. it's up to you, the chair of the Fed, to decide when to follow the rule and when not to follow the rule. But tell us about it. Tell us about why you've deviated. And I think that is going to be the new Trump policy. And he's got possibilities of appointing five members of the Federal Reserve Board, two vacancies that are existing, um, the, the, a regulatory uh, 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 vice chair, and Janet Yellen and Sam Fisher. So he can, in fact, reshape the board for decades to come. And I think that's something to watch out for. But nevertheless, I think right now, from a tactical <laughs> perspective, he couldn't care less if it's immediately uh, hawkish or immediately dovish. 
in your opinions on well, the I mean subject? I, I, I just think that you know, pe we're fooling ourselves if we, if we don't think that he, I mean, I think he will, if, if they do anything, he doesn't want, they'll aggressively, he'll go aggressively go after them. He said he's uh, secret uh, Congress, uh, not the executive. Uh, well, but I mean, I think he will use, mm -hmm. He will use Twitter like he does everything. They, they might so get, get a, Janet Yellen will get a. She might get an early a morning tweet. tweet, tweet she doesn't redirected. Like. Yes. A delete button. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Somebody needs to throw it away. That's my <laughs> opinion. He needs to get off of Twitter. Um, I, any other comments I, I on monetary I, policy? I, yeah, I think. Look, I think. I think Janet Yellen is. Um, I think Janet Yellen is going to run uh, the Fed um, like it's her last year, and it's probably her last year. I would right? say that's a. Good forecast. And that's so, I th so I think she, I, th I think she has the freedom to be relatively fearless in how she, and how she runs the Fed, with the institutional concerns that Bill mentioned in mind. Um, but you know, better than, you know, better than, um, you know, trying to impose a Taylor rule on the Fed. Um, it, it he might just appoint John, <laughs> right? Which is what I would. Uh, he I could, would or John one other John person has been discussed. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I would expect to, I would expect to see. Um, John on the shortest of short lists for the next Fed chair. So right. I think that's another accurate forecast. Mm -hmm. Right. Let's let's get to kind of the, the meat at the tail end of this. We didn't get a chance to get into immigration policy, but um, maybe afterwards people can chat with us. Uh, candidate Trump ran on bringing jobs back. And we can question, I guess, how successful anyone could be in bringing those jobs back. Technology globalization um, have, have really played a large role. Can he be somewhat successful? Maybe success would be measured in terms of less, reduce the rate of job loss, if you will. But are, are the concerns, let's say in a year or two, if they're not really concrete results, that Trump runs into trouble uh, in terms of trying to document, I brought these jobs back? I'll cover is that the unemployment rate in the United States is is relatively low right now. And so also, the labor force participation rate's come down significantly. Th that's too, that's though. correct. And, tr and 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 Trump during the campaign uh, made some very sweeping statements suggesting that the actual unemployment rate was was much higher. But I think that what we see on this jobs issue as a political issue in the U.S. is that it is often um, as the situation is often more about how people feel about jobs than what the actual job numbers show. There's been, a, been you know, President Obama has been, for, for most Americans, an, a fantastic jobs president. He's been a fantastic president on the economy in, in a lot of ways. Um, but certainly, you know, right now, the uh, U.S. unemployment rate is at, uh, at, at its lowest point during the previous eight years. So he's got to be rated as a success at that. But I think that a lot of what we saw in the election was it matters on this issue, at least in the United States, about how people feel emotionally about jobs and, and whether you know, their, their friends and their neighbors are losing their jobs. And, and, it, and it's very regional in the US. Um, if certain areas feel like they're losing jobs and the jobs are going other places, that can affect uh, a region and that can affect an election very dramatically. So I think that one of the things that he's proven himself already to be successful at is to convince people that he's fighting for them. And if he can do that, people might feel better about jobs. Let, let, let me amplify what, what Richard just said. It's a fact, it's been an enormous <coughs> job producing machine. Why? Because productivity is so low, right? And so you're hiring all these people, but where are you hiring them? Hospitality, retail, and healthcare. They account for the bulk of the job growth since 2009, and they pay $300, $407 a week, way below the average median wage. So the, the discontent that I mentioned earlier, the black swan event is, yeah, I'm getting a job, but I can't make ends meet. And why is that? And that's the, the problem that Donald Trump alone can't handle because mm. that comes from increasing productivity. And why has productivity not been increasing? Technology hasn't diffused, a lot of regulatory burdens, all of the stuff that, that economists are still struggling with to explain. But the discontent is right there. I've got a job, I've got multiple jobs, I still can't meet, uh, make ends meet. Income growth hasn't really kept up with expectations. Yep. I think Adam? I agree with everything that they just said. And I would say, add this, like if you had asked me in the White House February 2009 that at the end of President Obama's uh, second term, unemployment would be below 5%, will you take that trade? The answer would be obviously <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I think that the reality is that there's something more than just uh, jobs that underlines the discontent that you see uh, 
in certain parts of the U.S. and certain parts of the Western world. And I think economics is a big part of it, but it's this sense of a loss of a way of life. And what I, I worry about is that if you listen to candidate Trump and the Make America Great Again, America First, economic nationalism, is that there was like a two-part promise, right? One was economic jobs, <laughs> and then the other one was uh, it's going to be like it was in the good old days. And I worry that he can't deliver on either of those in a substantive way. Set aside the policies, because if you look at the policies that they're talking about now, whether you agree or disagree with those uh, domestic economic policies are primarily coming from Paul Ryan, they're not going to help those people. And I, that's not a knock on the, on the policies at all. That's just a fact. And so what does Trump do to appeal to them then, to make them feel like what Richard said? I think you see much more of this economic nationalism where he goes out there, beats up on companies like Carrier, beats up on multilateral uh, organizations. And I worry that that becomes the recurring theme um, and it's an easy play to run. And then the last thing I would add is this isn't just, when, it, when you think about it and reorient it, think it, it's about a loss of a way of life. It's then not just about globalization. It's also about technology. And I think a realistic possibility is what are they going to do when they realize like, oh, automated driving, that's going to cost millions of jobs. So how cooperative are we going to be with companies that care about automated driving when you put in place regulations at the federal level? And you talk to folks at Lyft and at Uber and mm -hmm. the large uh, American automobile companies. They say that the Obama administration has been very cooperative when it comes to thinking about a regulatory framework by which automated driving could occur. So you can see Trump in addition to beating up on the globalist aspect of this, also shifting and beating up on the technology aspect of it as well. And those people also occupy the coast. Adam, for every job lost as a driver, you're gonna see a hell of a lot more insurance adjusters out there. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, any other comments on this? Yeah, no, I, I think we, we have to do a better job of, again, of teaching and explaining that, you know, of, uh, what, is, what is really the cause of job loss, but not just that, not just explaining it. What do we, what do, we do, what is next? Uh, you know, I said the winner of this election was going to be the person who can best answer the question, you know, what happens to, what, what, what jobs are there for my children yeah. when uh, the robots take over, or the Chinese take over, or right. Chinese robots. <laughs> but, I did not you know. prepare the panel for the last question because I wanted to get a spontaneity. You didn't prepare us for any of any these, these questions. questions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Um, there are low expectations among many for a Trump administration. Name me something that the administration might actually accomplish that could be positive. <laughs> should I should I go to you first, Tony? Because yeah. they may not disagree. They come Sh up with sure. something. Sure. Uh, look, look. I, I actually think. I mean, uh, I'm going to be hopeful on, especially on 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 tax policy, uh, that we can have a, a, a you know a mature debate on tax policy and what that what that means. I'm going to be hopeful on that. I know a lot on both sides have have given a lot of uh, thought to it. So that's what I'll look for. Right. Adam. Well, one one thing I'm. I'm hopeful I do share uh, Tony's optimism. There's an incredible amount of overlap. It isn't exactly related to Trump, but and it actually touches what Tony's uh, said a couple times here is, I think that there's actually this real opportunity to have this fight over ideas about the benefits of globalization, the benefits of technological advancement. And either Trump will move over and take that position, which I hope he does, or he'll take the opposite side. And I think that's a debate that this side can win even if we've uh, lost some ground over the past couple of years. Bill? I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit there. I mean, the bilateral. What's the lowest? I think the lowest one is to be able to get the prof profits back here, right? That's right. almost Corporate guaranteed. Corporate tax repatriation, right? I like, I, like, um, I like Adam's answer that, that is, is like he's saying, uh, he said, well, the good thing that could happen is we could have like a robust discussion about these ideas. <laughs> it's a great <laughs> politician's answer. As but opposed to a food but fight? But, <laughs> but, I, but I think, uh, I actually think that um, the best thing, uh, and I think the reason why people, some people are having a positive emotional reaction is that uh, much like in other Western democracies, that in a lot of ways the system in the United States is broken and is not working for, um, you know, for the average American. And to the extent that um, a real shakeup of the system and, and hold on, you know, put your seatbelts on because there really is going to be, uh, you know, an earthquake in Washington, I think, uh, this coming year. But I think to the extent that shaking things up every once in a while in a really dramatic way is ultimately good for a system, a system of governance that is strong, uh, that, that there may be some good things that come of it. And, and you know, I mean, 
I, I do think that Trump is driven by what's good for Trump, but it may also turn out to be that what is good for him may also be good for the American people, and hopefully it's good for America's standing in the world, and hopefully it's good for the global economy. A good place to end this discussion. Please join me in thanking our outstanding group of panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you.